Let's look at kind of textbook curves. Let's look at inverted first. An inverted yield curve is going to have a complexion like that. Basically, this is going to be your maturities from three months out to 30 year, full inversion. These are yields. So, of course, as you go down into the maturity range to longer term, yields go down. They don't always have to be like that. They can have curves. They can have little kinks in them. Now, if we want to know what a normal curve is like, it's exactly the opposite. So as you go through time, one year, three year, five year, seven year, 10 year, the maturities, you see the yields go up. So if you had a 30 year, that was around 3%. You could have a two year, that was a 2% normal slope. It doesn't have to be exactly like that. Sometimes it could be curved. Now, speaking of curves, Here's the plot of the yield curve we have now. Starting with three months, one year, all the way out to third year. Like I said, here's time, here's yields, and here's what our current yield curve looks like. Now, where's the inversion? Well, as you move through time, a normal curve yields should be higher. Look what's going on here. That is not the case. So short maturities are a bit backward dated. And why is, should this be important to viewers? I'll give you a couple of easy reasons. If you have an inverted curve and you're thinking of doing a mortgage, which one do you think you want to pick? Anybody? Anybody? I'll tell you which one not to pick. Don't pick an adjustable rate mortgage. If rates are starting to move, I'm sorry, if rates are starting to move down, you want to use an adjustable rate mortgage. If rates are going up, you don't want to use an adjustable rate mortgage. But maybe the most important thing is the alarm clock for the Federal Reserve. It's going off potentially. Why? Because the whole point to the inversion of the curve is that many out there suspect traders see it first. You know how we're constantly talking about what's going on with regard to the yield curve and long maturities? Well, they're coming down. As they come down, the Fed's late to the game. So there's your inversion. If the Fed's late to the game, they're going to come in and push this down. And long end already pushed down, so the alarm clock of the Fed pay attention. Mike, what'd you think? just witnessed today. Uh, it was brutal. Obviously brutal. I mean, the markets rushed toward a place to say we have to start handicapping the probabilities of, uh, of a recession in this country. Today is Monday, June 21st. This is a recap for the stock market activities today. The big question of the day is, was this the end of the tantrum or was what we saw today a mere oversold rebound in the inflationary stocks of the market? Because overnight, we saw futures diving significantly lower. We also saw the 10-year Treasury yield going down below 1.4%. But all of a sudden, we saw a massive rebound overnight, and the indices opened higher, and it continued to gather steam throughout the day. And the 10-year Treasury yield closed at almost 1.5%. Now, whether the tantrum is over or not, that doesn't matter, because we will have more episodes of the tantrum Perhaps we saw the first episode of the tantrum lasting two days. And now we will see yields normalizing once again. And that will mean that the inflationary stocks will come back in favor. That is financials, industrials, materials, energy, etc. And the confirmation for that was the reaction in the U.S. dollar. We saw a massive reversal overnight and the U.S. dollar, as expected, went down, enabling commodities and the inflationary stocks, metals and the likes, to rise higher. Now, what is the point of the intro of this episode? The point is, the yield curve will normalize once again, but the message has been sent. And those of us 
who are paying attention should remember the reaction of the yield curve clearly because it will become relevant once again. Everybody's going to forget about it. Yields are going higher once again. We're back to normal. Nobody's worried about tapering or raising interest rates anymore. And the party goes on until the reaction we saw from the yield curve becomes relevant once again. The lesson here is the following. Back in 2019, the yield curve inverted. And you saw the one to three month treasuries yielding higher than the one to two years which is an inversion in the short end of the yield curve at the time if you remember many have been warning that a yield curve inversion is an ominous signal indicating that the economy will continue to thrive in the very near term but as you head into next year and beyond the economy will start to slow down significantly and every yield curve inversion was a predictor of an upcoming recession but here's what happened we saw a mini panic that lasted for a few weeks and then the market normalized again the yield curve started to normalize again and the stock market resumed the rally and reached all-time highs and at the time the the pumpers and the likes went on on television and the media and said, well, perhaps the yield curve is not relevant anymore. And perhaps a yield curve inversion doesn't mean what it used to mean. Perhaps it is different this time around. And we now know that the yield curve, that reaction was extremely relevant because the very next year we had the COVID-19 crash and the massive economic recession and slowdown that followed thereafter. Now, was the yield curve aware that there was a virus in a Chinese lab that's about to be released around the planet? Oh, wait a minute. Maybe I should have not said that. Hey, conspiracy theorist, what are you talking about a Chinese lab? Anyways, was the yield curve predicting or anticipating a virus to be unleashed all over the planet? Of course not. But the yield curve was predicting that the economy is about to slow down significantly in 2020. And perhaps COVID-19 was the spark, the trigger that enabled what was going to happen anyways. And therefore, the reaction we saw last week here in 2020, the first episode of the taper tantrum, will become extremely relevant in the next few months because we will revisit the conversation once again as we get closer to actual tapering. Not anticipation of tapering, but actual tapering. And the reaction of the yield curve sent an extremely important message. If the Fed starts to taper, doesn't matter if it's going to happen this year, next year. If the Fed is about to taper and raise interest rates, the economy will slow down significantly. Whether that is predicting stagflation, deflation, doesn't matter. What matters is that the economic growth will slow down significantly once the Fed starts to taper and raise interest rates. Now, the phenomena of stagflation inflation or lack thereof will depend on how far the Federal Reserve will allow inflation to grow. If the Federal Reserve pushes tapering down the road, then inflation will grow harder and perhaps we will hit the slowdown, the same slowdown of economic growth, but this time it will be stagflation. For now, the activities we saw today from the bond and stock markets indicate that perhaps the tantrum is cooling off and coming to an end. And the signs were already out there, by the way, ahead of time, that the drop of the 10-year Treasury yield is due to a tantrum. Because right after the Federal Reserve announced the dot plot indicating that the Fed is about to raise interest rates sooner than expected, the 30-year fixed mortgage rate started to blast higher. Now, the 10-year Treasury yield and the 30-year fixed mortgage rate have an extreme positive correlation. They trade together. So the divergence between the 30 years fixed mortgage rate and the 10 year treasury yield was the mystery. What's going on here? What's going on with the divergence? Which one is lying? Well, we now know that the 10 year treasury was lying due to the taper tantrum. And now we're seeing yields popping higher once again. And we have to stick to the facts here in deciding our investment strategy in the month to come. Do we stick with the inflationary trade? Do we move back to the NASDAQ? Do we move to cash altogether? Do we start another investment strategy, perhaps going to bonds? You gotta stick to the facts. Number one, is inflation rising higher or not? At least from the economic indicators that we have so far, inflation continues to rise higher. Whether we're talking about the CPI, whether we're talking about the PPI, whether we're talking about the Philly Manufacturing Index, the Empire Manufacturing Index, the Chicago PMI, the import to export prices, 
every single indicator pointing that inflation is rising higher and the Federal Reserve doesn't deny this fact. Furthermore, the housing bubble remains extremely hot. The stampeding continues across the country, and the mania shifts from buying homes to the rental market. Therefore, inflation is not going anywhere. And you might have read the headlines over the weekend that American Airlines is cutting certain flights all the way throughout July, the busiest season in the airlines industry. And the reason is labor shortages. What does that mean? It means that the travel industry, whether it is airlines, cruises, hotels, casinos, is experiencing a sharp recovery, where the demand is extremely hot. But these industries are struggling to find workers. And that means that wage inflation is about to happen, if it didn't happen already. Is that inflationary? or disinflationary. It is inflationary. And this is happening right now as we speak. In addition, we had Jerome Powell of the Federal Reserve testifying in Congress today. And he is panicking now due to the bonds and equities markets reactions. So he goes on in Congress and says that the Fed will remain accommodative to the market and the economy, meaning that the cocaine operation is going to be here for the foreseeable future. Don't worry about it. Stop it with the tantrum and go back to the casino already. Remember, what caused the market's confusion last week is the following. The Fed always maintained that they will be reactive in their approach to inflation, meaning they're going to wait for inflation data to tell them that inflation is getting out of hand before they start tapering. So why is the Federal Reserve all of a sudden last week started to become proactive, indicating that interest rates will rise as soon as 2022 to average inflation to 2%? Why is the sudden change from reactive to proactive? And this is what caused the tantrum in the market. Market. But now Papa Jerome is saying, did I say uh, proactive? No, we'll go back to reactive. We're going to wait till inflation gets out of hand completely before we start enacting any policy. Furthermore, we talked about uh, Jim Bullard. He opened his mouth last week and he said that he was one of the dots indicating that interest rates should rise as soon as 2022. And that further inflamed the tantrum in the stock and bonds markets. Well, now Bullard says, did I say 2022? Uh, I meant we're going to stay accommodative for as long as possible. And of course, the market likes it when the Fed starts retracting from their hawkish stance. They didn't retract completely, by the way, but the market likes any retraction from any hawkish stance. And therefore, armed with these facts that inflation continues to rise higher, and we're about to enter an inflationary period of wage inflation, and the housing bubble continues to grow hotter and hotter by the day. And the Fed is now playing games, showing us a hawkish stance on Wednesday, and now the very next week, they retreat back to somewhat of a dovish stance once again. Given these facts, you have two roads to follow in this stock market. You follow the inflationary side of the market that favors yields going higher, that favors inflationary value and reopening stocks, or do you follow the other road, the disinflationary way, where yields go down, favoring tech, high multiple, and stay-at-home stocks? Well, you know where this guy stands. I'm with the inflationary stocks. My portfolio is still overweight, inflationary stocks. And I will not change my weighting until the facts change. And so far, nothing has changed at all. Now we have some geniuses out there in Wall Street and the likes, you know, the financial advisors, the financial experts, who by the way, their guess as good as yours or mine, but they get paid thousands if not millions of dollars to manage portfolios and their greatest idea is the barbell portfolio meaning you buy both sides of the market the inflationary side and the disinflationary side what is the point if i'm paying you thousands of dollars percentage of my portfolio to manage it and your greatest idea is i'm gonna take your chips and spread them all over the roulette table well duh the ball is gonna land somewhere on the roulette table or perhaps you have some chips betting on that particular spot but what about the other chips they end up losing so if your greatest idea is the barbell strategy betting all over the roulette table what is the point here do you have the conviction to choose one way or the other, given the facts, given your analysis and your expertise. Otherwise, what the hell? I'll just give a bunch of kids, Robin Hood kids, some beer and pack of cigarettes, 
and to manage my portfolio better than these experts. I maintain the conviction that the inflationary trade will continue to outperform until and unless the facts change. If we get closer to tapering, we get a little taste of what happens when tapering takes place in the market. We're not going to wait all the way there. The moment we get closer to tapering, the inflationary trade will go out of favor. We get a little taste, a little clue of what will happen when tapering starts. And it certainly wouldn't be good for the entire market, but specifically for these inflationary stocks. Perhaps financials will continue to outperform, but that's pretty much it. We're going to stick with the facts, folks, and if they change, we'll adapt. And before we start, here's the other important story of the day, the crypto market. Bitcoin is crashing along with other cryptos, and it's not looking good here. I'm watching the chart live, and boy, it's getting extremely dangerous. The level of 30,000 is a must-keep for the laser beams. If they fail to keep 30,000, oh boy, the floodgates will be wide open. All of these uh, institutionals that you laser beams keep touting, look at the institutionals, bro. They're adapting Bitcoin. These institutionals are the weakest hands. The moment BTC cracks below 30,000, these quote-unquote institutionals will be the first to run and rush the exit door. And of course, cryptos and Bitcoin are crashing because China decided to crack down on Bitcoin. It appears as if China doesn't want Bitcoin at all. It wants to ban mining for the cryptocurrency because they have the digital one. And Bitcoin is a competition to the Chinese state digital coin. But I know the laser beams keep saying cryptos are the future, bro. Bitcoin uh, stay poor, boomer. Tell me again, what is the future for this tulip if China, India, Turkey, and now even the US working to ban Bitcoin mining and trading? Are we going to rely on aliens, on Uranus, to prop up cryptos? Where is the use if the largest countries in the world are banning using cryptocurrencies? It is mind-boggling. Anyhow, we will talk about that and a lot more during the coverage of this program. But for now, let's start by covering the market's performance today. And here we go. The Dow Industrial Average closing in the green by 586.89 points, or a gain of 1.76%. The Nasdaq closing in the green by 111.10 points, or a gain of 0.79%. The S&P 500 closing in the green by 58.34 points, or a gain of 1.40%. Now, the rise of yields today, the bounce, did not hurt the Nasdaq. The Nasdaq rallied along with the Dow and the SPY, the inflationary, the reopening stocks. The Nasdaq joined the rally for now. But the devil is always in the details. When you look at the details of the Nasdaq, the big cap technology names and the value names within the tech sector led the rally today, not the high multiple mania tech stocks. In addition, the Nasdaq will not start panicking again until yields reach and recapture 1.6% once again. It will be a tough road for yields to capture 1.6% right away. We're going to see multiple stops, perhaps corrections along the way. But if we get to 1.6% again, then we're back to favoring the inflationary stocks and fading the Nasdaq. What about the sector's performance today, leading the pack at number one and capturing the gold medal, energy, at number two for the silver, materials, and at number three for the bronze, industrials. The inflationary stocks, the inflationary trade is leading the market today. We're not going to shame any sector of the market today because every single sector managed to close in the green. What about the advance to decline ratio? The NYSE, 82% advancing versus 16% declining. The NASDAQ, 59% advancing versus 39% declining. Now, we saw an awful breadth on Friday, and that should have been a warning signal. So what's with the reversal today, the 180? There are lots of explanations. Perhaps the tantrum is over. There are other explanations that Friday was a bad day for the indices due to quad witching. We'll see. This is just one day worth of a rebound bound a big one specifically the inflationary side of the market is it sustainable or not that is the million dollars question is it just a mere rebound or is the tantrum over this is what we will try to answer in the duration of this video by looking at futures looking at the options market and charts speaking of here it is futures what's going on here we're seeing a massive rebound across the board 
starting with crude oil. Gains with over 2.5% for the WTI and about 2% for crude oil Brent. Remember, oil prices were not hit during the commodities correction on Thursday. And there are calls now that we will see the 80 handle on crude oil prices by August. And I concur, 80 perhaps a little more conservative, maybe a little more. Maybe we'll see 85 to 90. Tell me again that inflation is gone and it was transitory and it was overhyped. Anyways, what about softs? We're seeing big gains here for lumber, coffee, sugar, OJ, all closing with massive gains of about 2% or more. Meanwhile, coca and cotton futures closing at the flat line. And here it is, metals, the US dollar making a 180 overnight, a massive reversal, perhaps the tantrum is over, and here you go, metals prices rebounding higher. Gold closing with gains of about 1% for the day, and we saw gains for palladium, platinum, and copper. Meanwhile, silver futures, the underperformer today, closing pretty much at the flat line. What about meats? Remember, the big tech, lean hogs, was not touched by the correction at all. We saw a massive correction in lumber corn copper but lean hogs was not touched at all now we're seeing lean hogs futures entering a mild correction so far will it intensify and we see massive losses for lean hogs i doubt it because you're not going to be able to print 3d hogs not going to happen the demand for hogs is still sky high at least from china now the chinese played that cute trick of crashing the commodities market and then buying commodities aggressively at lower prices. Again, there is no sheriff in town. If you can manipulate the prices to be favorable to you by crashing the market and then buying the dip at lower prices, then have at it. It's a jungle, unregulated one, and there is no sheriff in town. Likewise, we're seeing a mini rebound for grains futures. We saw a big rebound on Friday's session, but now we're moving into new contracts. And so far, we're seeing a mild reaction in grains futures. But you got to remember this. We're seeing a biblical drought in the western United States. We're also seeing extreme dehydration and dry conditions in the corn belt of the United States. There are wildfires in North Dakota and the weather so far in Iowa, Illinois isn't favorable. However, the weather in the southern United States, where the region had plenty of rain so far, the crops output is making up for the losses from the west and the corn belt. But remember, the southern United States doesn't produce everything. But when it comes to crops that farmers in the south are able to produce, for example, wheat, Kansas is producing an extra output of wheat because there was a lot of rain in that particular state. And that is making up for the lack of output from other states. But all in all, the story remains. We have a massive drought in the US and Brazil, the two largest producers of grains. Meanwhile, the demand remains high from China. So all of this talk about the crash in grains prices and it's over, inflation is gone, it was transitory. Be careful about this narrative because the conditions, regardless of the monetary policy the weather you can have the fed cannot control the weather i don't know if they can that would be news to me maybe at jackson hall in the secret meeting they have their weather agenda but absent of that the weather is not favorable for the supply to meet the demand and the most critical period at least for corn and soybeans is july the seeding happens in july and if the weather doesn't improve in the corn belt we're talking about Iowa, Illinois, Wisconsin, North Dakota. Then we're going to have another year where the supply is short of demand. Therefore, grains futures will remain a hot trade. Moving on to the big casino, the options market. What's going on here? We're seeing a massive bounce in the market, but we're not seeing a confirmation from the options market. The volume is tamed today. Is it too early for the casino? Perhaps we will see the volume picking up tomorrow. We'll see. But for now, it's not looking good so far. You need that gamma squeeze to move the market higher. You need more appetite in buying call options. But so far, we have Apple at number one with about 1 million contracts, about 70 1% of those were calls. At number two, Tesla, the souffle, with about 950,000 contracts, about 50% of those were calls. And here it is, 
AMC. Watch out here, the warning signals are starting to flash red. With about 800,000 contracts trading today, about 64% of those were calls. When the volume starts to recede, the gamma squeeze will also start to recede. Market makers sell these options, out of the money calls, anticipating that they will expire worthless by the end of the week. We know that the apes are buying weekly expiration calls. If you don't see a massive appetite in buying call options on Monday and Tuesday, and the stock is now moving higher, then by Wednesday, market makers will decide to dump the stock instead of buying it, because they'll realize that the gamma squeeze is coming to an end. The appetite from the retail investors and traders who've been consistently buying the stock in call options is suddenly disappearing. What you want to see is high options volumes, specifically for call options, on Monday and Tuesday. And the stock starts to move higher by the tune of 5 6%. And by Wednesday, market makers make the decision, you know what, there is the risk that all of these call options that we sold out of the money are going to be in the money by Friday. And therefore, we have to stampede and buy the stock. And that ignites the gamma squeeze and you see the stock pushing higher impulsively absent of that you will see the reverse situation a reverse gamma squeeze where market makers do the opposite instead of buying the stock they start dumping their current holdings and by the way perhaps this is an explanation for the weakness in amc take a look at the ticker wish this is another meme stock where the redditors and the likes are migrating to and if the apes figure out that AMC is boring now, there is no action, it has been consolidating in range for over a week now, but there was a lot of action in Wish, they were moving to Wish, and that is the biggest risk to the apes. It's not about diamond hands or to the moon, bro. It's all about your fellow apes. Are they going to stick to the plan or are they going to jump to another tree with more bananas? In this case, Wish. What about the unusual trades in the options market today, starting with the ticker SPY? the S&P 500. They're making another bearish bet here, perhaps insurance, by buying the 350 puts expiration date July 23rd, with expectations that the name will drop by over 17% by then. They paid about 50 cents a piece to enter this trade, all in all, bringing the total to about $2 million. And here it is, what about the ticker WISH, W-I-S-H. They're betting for more gains here to come, at least all the way till the end of the week. Pay attention here, this is how gamma squeeze happens they're buying calls expiring friday if they are successful in pushing the stock further to the upside by wednesday market makers will start to panic and they will stampede to buy the stock in this case they're buying the 14 and a half calls expiration date this upcoming friday june 25th with expectations that the name will rise by over six percent by then and they paid about a buck a piece to enter this trade. All in all, bringing the total to about one and a half million dollars. What about the ticker FCX, Freeport McMoran? A classic inflationary stock. It has been a hot stock since last year and the poster boy for the inflationary era of the market. We saw a massive correction of about 20% or so from the highs, and perhaps the stock is bottoming here because they're buying calls, specifically the 38 calls expiring July 2nd, with expectations that the name will rise by the tune of over 6% by then, and they paid about 50 cents a piece to enter this trade. All in all, bringing the total to about half a million dollars. What about the trade for the ticker ETSY, Etsy? They're buying the 185 calls expiration date this upcoming Friday, June 25th. Very interesting trade, by the way. And they're expecting Etsy to rise by over 8% by then. They paid about 50 cents a piece to enter this trade. All in all, bringing the total to about $400,000. Continuing with interesting trades, what about the trade for the ticker SHOP Shopify? They're buying the 1,600 calls. And by the way, is this stock about to split? or what regardless of what you and i think about stock splits they don't change anything at all they don't add value at all but the maniacs out there the SPAC generation of investors think that there is added value when the stock splits we saw that last year with apple and tesla and this year with nvidia and perhaps it's coming for shopify because they're buying the 1600 calls expiration date this upcoming friday with expectations that the name will rise by over eight percent by then they paid about six bucks 
bucks a piece to enter this trade. All in all, bringing the total to about three and a half million dollars. What about the trade for the ticker MSFT Microsoft? They're buying the 277 and a half calls expiration date July 30th with expectations that the name will rise by over 6% by then. They paid about two bucks a piece to enter this trade. All in all, bringing the total to about one million dollars. What about the trade for the ticker MOS Mosaic? This is a classic inflation trade, it's a fertilizer company, and the name has been riding high since the beginning of the year, even before the beginning of the year, since the election of Joe Biden. But recently we saw a massive correction in the name, perhaps it's overdone here, whether it is an oversold bounce, whether it is a dip worthy of buying, that remains to be seen. But for now, they're using a safe strategy to hop back in the trade for MOS via buying call options. Instead of risking a massive amount of capital buying the dip by buying the stock, why not buy call options? And if the stock moves in the direction you're anticipating, you have the option of buying the stock. In this case, they're buying the 33 and a half calls expiration date july 9th with expectations that the name will rise by over eight and a half percent by then they paid about 30 cents a piece to enter this trade all in all bringing the total to about 160 thousand dollars what about the trade for the ticker tsla the souffle they're buying a put here, a big one. The 470 puts expiration date, July 2nd, with expectations that the souffle will crash and get cooked to death by the tune of over 25% by then. And they paid about three bucks and 35 cents a piece to enter this trade. All in all, bringing the total to about one and a half million dollars. Now the technicals are still favorable for the souffle. However, this is a bit against Bitcoin. In my opinion, if Bitcoin crashes, cracking below 30,000, that will open the stairway to hell where Bitcoin will reside and go down all the way to 20,000. Now, Tesla's only investing about $1 billion in Bitcoin. Yes, the stock should take a hit, but a better bet against Bitcoin will be Coinbase or my pick, MicroStrategy. If Bitcoin cracks below 30,000, I'm going to go all in buying put options on MicroStrategy because drunk Michael Saylor went all in in his Bitcoin bet. If it goes the other way, the company is going to go down to zero. Zero. It's gone. He went all in. And if this trade doesn't work, goodbye, MicroStrategy. Moving on to the heat map analysis. And this is important. I know a lot of you skip this part because you think I just read the map. Oh, here's green. Here's red. No, 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 no. I'm finding themes for you. I'm trying to read the psychology of the market because the obvious is the inflationary trade is back in favor, a massive rebound, whether it is financials, but specifically regional banks, whether it is industrials across the board, energy, materials across the board, gold, copper, silver, steel, doesn't matter. The defensive names all riding higher. So did the reopening trade, airlines, cruises, hotels, casinos. But what is underperforming here? You have the high multiple names in the automotive sector of Lee Auto, Neo, Xpeng, etc. Likewise, it is the high multiple names within the tech sector that underperform today. We're talking about Airbnb, we're talking about Pinterest, we're talking about Twilio. Remember the names that outperformed on Friday are now underperforming. High multiple names like AMD, Nvidia, Square, Okta, CrowdStrike, all of these names are underperforming. But what's working today? The value names within the technology sector. For example, take a look at the chip sector. You have value names like Texas, Qualcomm, Intel, AMAT, LAM Research, these are overperforming today. Meanwhile, the high multiple names, AMD and NVIDIA, underperforming. You can blame it on cryptos, that's fine. But I see a consistent theme here, not just today, but throughout the last couple of weeks, where we have names like Cisco, IBM, Oracle, Adobe, VMware, at performing. These are the so-called old school tech aka value and these are catching a bid today in addition to facebook google and now we have apple and microsoft now the big cap technology names apple microsoft facebook google these are going to rally when the market decides to buy 
the Nasdaq, the Triple Qs, or shall we say when the algos start to buy the Qs. The algos had a mini panic today regarding the Nasdaq in the morning because yields started to rise higher sharply and you saw the Nasdaq going back and forth. Not sure. The algos pump it, dump it, pump it, dump it. And then when yields settled at around 1.5%, or a little below that number, you started to see the NASDAQ catching a bit. So algorithmic trading has a massive role today in moving the NASDAQ in the same direction as the inflation trade. What about the themes analysis? Starting with the reopening trade. Gains across the board, massive gains, with no exception. Oh, what is that? AMC. Down about 6% or so. This is a meme stock. You know the story. Here it is, the inflation trade. And the guy you're listening to right now likes this performance because my portfolio is overweight the inflation stocks. Gains across the board, no exceptions at all. Whether we're talking about banks, whether we're talking about industrials, whether we're talking about defensives or commodity tied stocks, the likes of Freeport, Alcoa, all rising higher. What about the disinflationary stocks? Take a look specifically at the high multiple stocks. We're talking about Okta, Zoom, Nvidia, Square, Peloton, all underperforming today. Some of the high multiple names, the likes of Shopify and Snapchat, are outperforming today, notably DoorDash. But DoorDash had some uh, particular news for the company. They have a contract with uh, Albertsons to deliver groceries, and the stock market liked that piece of news. We saw DoorDash rising higher significantly moving on to the charts analysis starting with the spy 30 minutes chart if it is a massive gap down that was a bear trap because the expectations heading into today's trading session were for more downside for the spy and we actually saw that in the futures chart in the overnight session we saw a massive decline for the spy and then we saw the rebound along with yields for the spy's chart itself we saw a massive pop in the morning recapturing 417.30 and then recapturing the very important level of 420 for support as if the chart is saying watch out here not too fast this was a tantrum and the sell-off in the inflationary side of the market is not going to last forever a lot of traders a lot of investors are interested in buying the dip in the these names they indeed did so today the next challenge for the spy will be 422 that will be the prior gap left from Friday. If the chart is able to crack above 422, then we'll go back to the resistance of 423. The expectations now heading into tomorrow's trading session is we have a bull flag consolidation, a mini one, a very small baby one. But that will enable the chart to go all the way to at least 422. And we will await the reaction of the SPY at that level. Do we close the gap and reverse down again? Or does the chart closes the gap, consolidates for a little while, gathering energy, and then blasting higher to meet 423? That will be the healthy way, the bullish way. And here it is, daily chart of the continuous contract. As I said before, during the overnight session, we saw more losses for the SPY futures. But once yields started to rebound higher, SPY's futures started to rebound higher. Closed not quite above the resistance level of 4,232, but close enough. That will be the next challenge. When we look at the momentum indicators, the RSI and the MACD indicators, there is some minor technical damage. It could be repaired by tomorrow if we see another rally higher. To me, the chart is not relevant. And the only chart that is relevant is that of the 10-year Treasury yield. If we see Treasury yields rising higher again overnight, all the way recapturing 1.55, that will be very good for the SPY because financials, industrials, the inflationary trade will continue to rise higher. In addition, we're not going to see significant damage to the NASDAQ. If anything, the NASDAQ will continue to rally higher along with the SPY, along with the inflationary trade until we reach 1.6% in the 10-year Treasury. Then the test restarts. Can the NASDAQ hold when yields are trading at 1.6 again or do we revert back to the same story before the Fed's decision on Wednesday, last Wednesday? And here it is, the Qs, the NASDAQ, 30 minutes chart, trading within range. In the beginning, we saw the NASDAQ diving lower, catching the support almost at 340. When the algos realized the 10-year yield is not going to rise above 1.5%, the algos decided, well, that's good enough for the NASDAQ. The Nasdaq can rally higher all the way until 1.6. Until then, let's push the Nasdaq higher and now it is consolidating underneath the resistance level of 344.5. 
we have a gap. You don't want to see a reversal before closing the gap and before recapturing a very important resistance level of 344 and a half. Doing so will be an ominous signal, but the expectations for now that the Nasdaq will be able to crack above this level and close the gap. Here is a daily chart for the continuous contract. The momentum indicators remain healthy remain positive and the chart is trading above the very important level of 14,000. And this is the beauty, by the way, between contrasting the triple Qs with the current contract of the NASDAQ futures. There are things that you're not going to be able to see in the triple Qs chart. And this is one of them. In the futures contract, the chart is already trading above the last resistance level of 14,000. What does that mean? It means that the sky is the limit. You got to wait for the chart to decide where is the next resistance level. Moving on to the IWM 30 minutes chart. We talked about the oversold conditions in the IWM and that chart should merit a rebound. This is exactly what we saw the IWM outperforming the Dow, the Nasdaq, the S&P 500. And the reason is while we saw some pain in the meme stocks, we saw the reopening stocks outperforming significantly. And we saw the small cap names in the financials and energy sectors of the market also outperforming significantly and therefore pushing the IWM higher. Now, we have a gap at 227. That was closed today, yet we don't have a definitive conclusion for the action today because the chart decided to close below that number by the end of the day. What you don't want to see is a chart that goes all the way to the gap, closing the gap and then reversing lower. That is not good. It is too early to say that the IWM is reversing. It did the deed of rebounding and closing the gap and now it should turn 180 back to the downside. Too early to make that conclusion. For all we know, the chart is consolidating, building and gathering energy to resume the rebound higher above 227. And I say that because looking at the RSI indicator, there is still a lot of room for the IWM to run. It could go all the way to 230 before catching some resistance. You wake up in the morning and you see a reversal and the IWM is trading below 226. Then you know that the IWM will go all the way down to the support level of 223 and perhaps close the gap below that level. Now, as a trader, you should have spotted the trade on Friday. You should have seen that the IWM is oversold. You buy the call options, you get the massive rebound on Monday, and you close those. You don't want to play the guessing game, but if you are too late and you did not catch the call options trade on Friday, you can follow this guideline of watching the reaction around 227. Trading above that level means that there are more gains to come. You want to buy calls. Trading below that level by tomorrow, meaning that the chart will go down all the way to 223 once again. Moving on to the Dixie, the dollar index. Here it is, massive reversal. We're anticipating this reversal during the last video and now the dollar index is trading below 92. So is that all there is for the taper tantrum and the dollar starts trading down? How far down? We have 91, that is the first level of support we're watching. But us retail traders seldom trade the FX market. We watch the signals from the US dollar to trade other commodities and stocks. In this case, if the US dollar is about to reverse, going all the way down to 91, that will be good for gold, metals, commodities, and perhaps the commodities-related stocks, steel, aluminum, etc. Speaking of, here it is, gold. What's going on here? It talked about buying call options on Friday for the GLD, and that is paying off right now. Gold is bouncing back from the Fibonacci level around 1760. It is way oversold, and the US dollar is reversing downward. For now, these are good conditions for gold. But you got to be careful here because gold has two enemies, the US dollar and yields. If yields continue to pop higher, then gold will push and slam the brakes once again. Watch the top of this candle around 1,812. That should be an important level of resistance for gold. I will exit the GLD trade if gold trades all the way to that level because I am expecting resistance at this level. Specifically, if yields continue to rise higher, for me, that will be a warning signal that I should exit and take my profits in the GLD trade. And here it is, the chart of the day, the 10-year treasury yield. Overnight, it was a massive panic. The tantrum intensified and overdone the move in yields, going all the way down to 1.35%, which is absurd. 
absolutely ridiculous given all of the inflationary data we're getting. And that was a no-brainer for bond traders to take profits from the tantrum. They started buying bonds, remember, way back a couple of weeks ago after the non-farm payroll report. And they continued to buy bonds even after the CPI. So bond investors and bond traders were sort of planting the seeds for this move way before the Fed hinted, keyword hinted, at tapering. Is the move over now? And we see yields resuming the rally higher. Is one way to think about the chart. We saw an ABC bottoming pattern, a massive flush down, and now we have a bottom. Are we about to see a positive ABC pattern where yields face the resistance of 1.5% or down for a little bit, perhaps all the way to 1.45%, and then blasting higher once again to recapture 1.55%? Could it happen? Certainly possible. What about bond prices? The TLT weekly chart. Again, reversing before closing the gap and before reaching 1.49. Excuse me, 149. This is the TLT. Too early to say one way or the other. This is just one day worth of activities. This is a weekly chart. But if we violate 140, which is the bottom of the previous candle, that will be an indicator that the move in bonds is pretty much over the bounce is over and we will start to see yields popping higher again perhaps the tlt will go down all the way perhaps making another higher low and that will keep the hope alive for bond bulls but if the chart goes down making a lower low and most importantly violating 134 and a half then bond bulls should run to the hill for now everything is stable but take a look at the rsi curling slightly downward too early but these are the signs we watch for what about the vix two hours chart we talked about the 20 level the very important level of 20 the spy popping higher the vix no brainer it goes down but the vix was actually trading significantly higher going all the way to the level of 22 it was riding higher by the tune of over 10 percent in the morning as we saw pain inflicted all over the futures market but once that rebound in yields took place, we saw futures, specifically the SPY, rebounding higher. The VIX started to reverse to the downside. We were anticipating, if you remember last night, I was saying if we wake up in the morning and we see the SPY gapping downward significantly, and we see the VIX gapping higher by a lot, 10% or more, perhaps that would be a top for the VIX and a bottom for the S&P 500. And this is exactly what the overnight session traders did by popping the SPY by the morning and reversing the VIX to the downside. And the VIX is going all the way to the trend line it has created. This is the positive trend line. It has created from breaking the negative trend line that lasted for a few weeks. Is this bad for the VIX? Is it good for the VIX? Neither. The VIX is going back to the trend line, the positive trend line until and unless the VIX breaks the positive trend line then the VIX has a problem that will be an indicator the SPY will blast to all time highs once again but if we see a rebound for example the VIX reaches the trend line and rebounding higher and watch out you thought Friday was a bull tra a bear trap perhaps today was a bull trap and here comes the roller coaster ride once again it's a fun market isn't it and here it is, the big kahuna, Apple, 30 minutes chart, reclaiming 131 for support. The chart did not look bad to begin with, it was consolidating below 131 by a little bit, and today it managed to recapture 131 for support once again. Is this bearish or bullish behavior? This is bullish behavior. And the next resistance line for Apple is 135. And now we're seeing Apple reclaiming its leadership in the volume of the options market. And if we continue to see more call options buying in Apple, then perhaps that will enable the stock to reach the next resistance level of 135. And remember, as Apple goes, so will the Nasdaq. What about the souffle? What's going on here? We still have higher highs and the chart keeps knocking and knocking and knocking at 629. Is this bearish behavior or is this bullish behavior? It is bullish behavior. The chart's consolidating underneath a very important resistance level, knocking over and over and over again. The intentions for Tesla is to crack above 629. But we have another wild card here in the mix and that is the crypto market and this is the genius of reverend elon musk by the way and i say that sarcastically because he now tied up tesla to the crypto market if we see a crash in bitcoin and doge perhaps tesla will follow through even though the investment in bitcoin is not that big he already dumped 10 percent of the investment and if he loses the entire cash invested in bitcoin will be bad but not that bad 
you want to talk about somebody in trouble, talk about drunk Michael Saylor. That is the guy who's going to get whacked completely if Bitcoin crashes starting tomorrow. What about Caterpillar? We talked about two trades, two potential trades for the week. Do you buy call options on the souffle or do you buy call options in Caterpillar? Well, if you bought call options in Caterpillar, on Caterpillar rather, last Friday, you scored big today because Caterpillar gapped higher in the morning, closing slightly below the highs, but the name remains oversold. And if you bought call options, it is the rational trade, expecting more gains for Caterpillar. But watch out for the top of the big red candle. That will be a resistance for now. Now the chart could go down tomorrow, closing the gap. If that happens, watch for the behavior around the gap, which coincides with the Fibonacci level. If the chart manages to close the gap, rebounding higher that will be an opportunity for those of us who missed on the trade who did not buy call options on friday to hop on the ride and buy call options for caterpillar you want to watch how the chart closes the gap and react from that point on closing the gap rebounding higher that is a positive signal that the rebound is not over yet and you should hop in and buy call options now the souffle is not looking bad either but there is the risk of the association with bitcoin so watch out for that and here is a weekly chart for caterpillar the daily chart is extremely oversold meriting an oversold bounce an oversold rally usually the oversold rally doesn't just last for one day it lasts for a few days perhaps weeks but looking at the weekly chart there is more room for pain here yes the sell-off was extreme, overdone, but look at what the chart did since the bottom last year. It has been a straight line to the upside. The MACD indicator has been trading in positive territory since last year. This is extreme. This is a weekly chart, and we should see a reversion to the mean in the MACD indicator. If that is the case, then from the long-term perspective, the weekly chart, Caterpillar could go down all the way to the next Fibonacci retracement level, around 185. Would that be bad? Would that be the end of the inflationary trade? Would that be the end of Caterpillar? Absolutely not. Remember, the fiscal spending, which is going to be on steroids, by the way, hasn't even started. So we remain bullish on Caterpillar. We're going to trade the bounce from a daily chart perspective via call options. And when the bounce is done, we're going to take those profits because the chart could reverse again and play the weekly chart perspective, which indicates that there is more room for pain here. What about AMC? What's going on here? 30 minutes chart. We talked about the Twin Peaks last time around, and so far that top is sticking. Sticking, not ticking. Sticking. And now we have another Twin Peaks, and the apes get mad every time I say Twin Peaks. Like, yeah, charts don't matter, bro. It's all about diamond hands, and to the moon, hoodle, hodl, whatever it is. It's not my problem. I'm just explaining to you the technicals and the mechanics of the options market. If you don't want to listen, that's your problem. For now, not a lot of damage happened. But the apes, go talk to your other baboons and chimps to start buying call options aggressively by tomorrow. Because if you fail to do so, then that will pave the way for a reverse gamma squeeze. And I've already explained to you what a reverse gamma squeeze is during the options market coverage. And by the way, we have a lot of gaps here to fill for AMC. There was one at the 50, there was another one at 32, and then we have 26, but we're taking one day at a time here. We have support, an excellent support at around 50. So let's say that gap is filled, watch out for the reaction of the stock. If it doesn't hold, and that will send an ominous signal that perhaps the stock will go down all the way to 32. But again, the key for success here is buying call options. And here it is, the tulip market. What a beating. Bitcoin BTC. The laser beams got excited for about three seconds. We're going back to 42,000, bro. It's over. Eat your words. And now, unfortunately, they're quiet once again. I feel bad for them, but again, remember their arrogance. They're an arrogant group of people. When Bitcoin was rising higher impulsively, the laser beams, the US dollar is dead. Uh, you don't understand, bro. Stay poor, boomer. And now what happened? What is the intrinsic value? of Bitcoin. What is the fundamental analysis? You're only relying on one man's tweets. That is Reverend Elon Musk. And he's not into it anymore. We have the Chinese cracking down. The Indians cracking down. The Turks are cracking down. The Americans are cracking down. The Martians are cracking down. Anyhow, 30,000. This is the level we're watching. Grab your popcorn and watch this chart all night long. If it cracks below 30,000, those laser beams will change into the deer in the headlights look. 
So watch out. Lastly, here is a chart I showed you a few weeks ago of the XME, the Materials ETF, and this is a monthly chart. This chart has been on a declining trend since the financial crisis, and this declining trend was broken as the inflation trade started to become the darling of the market. This is a change that is not transitory. Yes, it was an extreme pop higher, the move that is. It's going to have to slam the brakes at some point. Take a look at the RSI indicator. This is the monthly RSI. It became overbought. It became overextended. It is time for the XME to take a break. But for those who keep saying to me that inflation is over, it was transitory, it's time to go back to the NASDAQ, you don't understand, bro. No, you don't understand because this is a change that is happening for the first time in 10 years we're seeing these lagging sectors of the market the xme the xlf the xle the energy etf finally outperforming the technology and consumer cyclicals these sectors of the market that have been outperforming for over 10 years now this is a change and shift in regime and you have to be aware and awake to realize it. Moving on to the conclusion of this video. What do we have on the economic calendar tomorrow? We have existing home sales and that's pretty much it. Absent of more data, we're expecting the market to continue to bounce higher. Now, existing home sales, the expectations are that the inventory will be tight. So we'll be watching the reaction of home builders, the likes of Lennar, DR Horton, etc. But for the entirety of the market, there are no obstacles so far. We're past the Fed decision. And the market reverses the tantrum on Monday and perhaps a continuation of the rally tomorrow. And then we start to get into the juicier part of the week. Because Wednesday we have the manufacturing and services PMI. And that will be an indicator, an important one for inflation. What is the headline number? And what about prices? If we continue to see this contrast of headline numbers diving lower and prices maintaining their elevated levels, and the argument for stagflation is going to start to gather steam. Anyways, that's all I got for you tonight, and I will talk to you again tomorrow. If you found the information presented in this video helpful, please subscribe, press the like button, the notification button, and follow me on social media.